attention to some, some practical issues, and that is around a, a very important topic, a topic that is receiving enormous press, and that is around high potentials in talent development. Just real quickly, and this is the audience participation part, how many of you have a formal high potential program in your organization? How many of you think you should have a formal high potential program in your organization? About the same number. Uh, and it is, it's, it's, it's one of the hot topics, whether you read the popular press, whether you read the, the, uh, the stories of failed business gurus in HBR or other magazines, what you'll find is high potential is a, is a hot topic around the world. Why is it a hot topic? So what I wanna do is before I tell you five things that you ought to be paying attention to with high potentials, let me give you a reason why you should be paying attention. First, all you have to do is look at the headlines. What we see across organizations, what we see across surveys of organizations, is that around 66% of, of leaders that are hired from the outside, brought in to assume leadership roles in the organization, fail. They just don't make it. They don't make it for a variety of reasons. The issue, though, is every single one of those individuals has a negative impact on the organization, not only in terms of staff morale and engagement, but the bottom line results. What's even more shocking is that 48% of those who are promoted within the organization, the organization struggle and have problems as well. So even though we have leadership development programs, even though we may buy into the leadership pipeline growing our own talent, we still aren't necessarily doing it right. And I think that's a, a big challenge. The other piece is the time frame. You know, we talk about, and Adrian touched on the dark side. I always talk about the dark side or the HDS. It's, it's the person that you date versus the person that you marry. And when the honeymoon's over, you start to see what you really marry. <clears throat> well, 18 months later, oftentimes we find is when people start to struggle or fail. It's after that, that newness wears off. It's when they stop monitoring their behavior, or as, as Hogan would say, it's when they're just being themselves. So from our perspective, leadership is a critical issue. High potential selection is a critical issue. There was a study done by the CDC, the Center for Disease Control in the US. 66% of health-related issues come from stress. Well, what do 78% of working adults say is the most stressful part of their life? Their immediate supervisor, their immediate boss. <clears throat> there was a study done, it was 100,000 people exit surveys as they quit the organization on their own, and they were asked, what is the most stressful part of your job? It was my direct supervisor. So leadership really does matter. How much does it matter? A lot. Why does it matter, or what are the characteristics that are causing problems within organizations? Well, we asked a lot of people about that. We asked them, what is it that you find is just unbearable about your boss or about the individual for whom you report up to? It was really interesting because it parallels exactly with the language we use in the HDS. 52%, this was a sample of about 15,000 people, said 52%, it's around the arrogance. It's that about me attitude. It's I can, I can jump over, over buildings, I can run through walls. <clears throat> but what they forget about is the followership. What they forget about is the engagement in the organization. 50% said it was because bosses that lie, cheat, steal, or manipulative. Um, Bill Clinton, depends on what your definition of is, is. Uh, in terms of do I tell the truth or not. Emotional volatility, micromanaging, being passive aggressive, and distrusting others. It's important though to think about what, is it, what does it really mean from a team perspective. And again, Hogan didn't do his, his leadership talk this morning, so I'll, I'll steal from that, I'll borrow from that. The inability to build and maintain an effective team is what leadership's all about. So we've got the base rate for failure, we've got reasons why people fail. So again, why does it matter? Well, many of you, oh, I'm sorry, 69% uh, of Americans think we have a leadership crisis. Two thirds of Americans think voting makes leadership better. Our view is those people who say they can get the country moving again really shouldn't be in charge because it goes back to being manipulative and arrogant. When we think about what's coming, most of our clients talk about the challenges they have finding leaders. We were in Asia a couple weeks ago. They're having to promote people into VP, director, executive director level roles that may be 28 years old, maybe 32 years old. They're on their second rotation. They've only been with the company two years. They may have only been out of university for three. 
why this and the direct reason is we have a shrinkage of individuals at that traditional management age level. This was some data that was done five years ago. <clears throat> it still holds true. The percentages are remain the same. The percent decline of workers, ages 35 to 44, by the end of 2011, what you found was a 19% decrease in the US, 27% in Germany. The Germans are in trouble. The Germans right now are importing leaders. The United States isn't much better. China, it's interesting. China has a plethora of people, right? However, in terms of individuals that have been groomed, individuals that are ready to move into those leadership roles, what they will say is, it's a dismal situation. How do you fast track? How do you move people into roles that, that, that they can accept, that they can excel in, when they've had little to no experience? So we've got a problem of, of derailment. We've got a problem of quantity of potential leaders. We've got a problem of failure. Before we talk about how to select high potentials, what we need to do is define what we mean by leadership, because a high potential, by definition, should be a leader. They should be someone that others are willing to follow. The traditional view, the traditional HR view, is that leadership is defined by how many stars you have on your collar or how many bars you have on your sleeve. It's positional power. If you're in, in a position of power, then by definition, you must be a leader and other people are willing to follow you. If that's the definition from an HR perspective, well, then how do we measure it? Well, <coughs> simply we ask their boss, how well are they doing? We ask their supervisor. What's really interesting, if you look at the research on boss ratings on 360s, they actually cover the least amount of variance. They're actually the least predictive of actual job performance. That is to say, our bosses and our supervisors generally don't know how we're actually doing and if they really know what we're really doing. The other piece is, where are we focused? Well, competencies are here to stay. The last two days in our advanced workshop that we facilitated, we talked a lot about competencies and how we're stuck with them. However, organizations tend to focus their, their leadership evaluation on some competency model. Not the outcome of the model, but rather simply, what are the competencies valued by the organization and how does the person live up? Or how are they measured against those competencies? <coughs> So in essence, if you take the HR view, a high potential or a leader advances by pleasing their boss, they're loyal and they have some technical knowledge, uh, and really their performance is dictated by how much people like them, or the evaluation of their performance is dictated by how much people like them. We want to present an alternate view. We call it the Hogan view of leadership or the Hogan leadership model. And again, for us, leadership is defined as the ability to build and maintain a high performing team. If you think back, we evolved as group living animals, correct? We all live in a social society. Over time, threats emerge, and what did somebody have to do? Someone had to step up and be willing to point people in the same direction. Say, come on guys, let's go protect our homeland, let's go protect our food crop, let's go protect our future. That didn't mean that they necessarily were the boss, but they were an emerging leader. They were someone who could step up and rally a team to defend against a common enemy. If that's how we're going to define leadership, then we can evaluate it pretty easily, and that's by the team's performance. It's not about the leader, it's about how the team performs. Does the, the team that this person's responsible for, do they outcompete and beat the competition? And then finally, where's the focus? It should be on the qualities that are needed to be a successful leader, and that is the qualities that are valued by the team. I'll talk in a moment about engagement, how engagement's driven from your middle line and entry level supervisor roles. Those are the individuals that actually drive the performance of the organization. So for us, if you define it as the ability to build and maintain a team, you look at it from a team's performance perspective, and then finally you focus on the qualities that a team wants, we think it really clarifies what we need to do in terms of measurement. And that is, it clarifies the meaning and purpose of leadership for the rest of our models in HR. Second, it helps us very quickly define bad leadership. As Bob said, we're, the, we're, we're known as the guys that don't provide all the good news. We're more than willing to provide bad news. And then third, it helps us evaluate performance accurately. With that said, <clears throat> we talk about personality, engagement, and business unit performance. Real quickly, our view is personality drives behavior. Behavior directly impacts staff morale, and that's true. And staff morale, as you know, if you've been on British Airways or if you've been on Emirates Airways, staff morale drives the experience you have. I'll let you decide which one is good and which one is bad. 
Seven round drives engagement. Engagement drives business unit performance. Based on your last flight, unless you're a slave to frequent flyer miles, you may choose differently. Personality also drives value, the type of culture we'll create. Let's stick with my airline example. There are completely different cultures at those two airlines. That culture drives the type of people that are attracted to their organization, and also the type of culture that they will, in essence, <clears throat> uh, pervade out to the rest of the employees. Again, driving engagement, driving business unit performance, and then finally, personality, and Bob talked about judgment, good decisions, and decisions that are corrected very quickly drive engagement. A leader being willing to say, I made a mistake, we need to shift our strategy, is much better than a leader that just stands there when everyone else is saying, you made, made a bad decision, and they say, oh well, hmm, what do we do now? Again, driving engagement and business unit performance. So when we think about what organizations should be doing, we've got to look really at, at five, five key things. Before I go through these, let me give you four or five things that organizations are doing poorly in terms of high potential development. What we see are the trends. Organizations are focusing on what a person's done, their technical knowledge, their technical skill. As Adrian said this morning, you take your best salesperson and you turn them into a sales manager and what happens? You gain a really bad boss and you lose a really good performer. Second, what we're finding is they lack objectivity and accurate measurement. It's about rumors, it's about hearsay, it's about people's opinions versus the hard data. The third thing, and I don't know how much this is in Europe, I know it's pervasive in the United States, once you're identified as a hypo, you're a hypo. It's almost like a badge that you can now wear that says, I can do no wrong, I am on the fast track up the greasy pole. And then finally, what we also know about high potential programs is they're not accounting for the changing nature of work. And let's face it, work is changing. The globalization, the fast, rapid decisions that we have to make, it's not your traditional <coughs> leadership development program anymore that will be successful. So if organizations want to ensure a competitive advantage of identifying and engaging others, they've got to develop their high performers. And we're going to walk through these five characteristics that we feel like organizations uh, should be engaged in. First is defining potential corrective. Well, it's the 20, it's the 80 20 rule, and that is 20% of your, your, your work or 20% of your employee base is actually doing 80% of your work. And what we also know is that if you look at your high potential pool, really only about 20 to 30% of those are actual high potentials. So what we know is that high potentials have some of the following characteristics. First and foremost, they're rewarding to deal with. Other people will interact with them. They don't walk into the office and say, oh, I'm a high potential, why don't you follow me? But rather, they're genuine. They actually act with, with genuine feelings. Second, they're willing to learn quickly. They're willing to do different tasks. Some of the best high potential programs that we've evaluated, you're sent on different rotations. You're taken out of your comfort zone, out of your environment, and you're willing to grow and develop quickly in those different areas. Third, they do seem leader-like, and they're willing to take initiative. These aren't your high potentials, again, that walk in and say, I'm in the program, now organization move me forward. But rather are engaged in active participation across their assignments. There's really four other things that we know really matter, and that's acting with integrity, being competent. High potentials do have to be competent. They just can't be liked by everybody. Having good judgment and also having some vision. People often ask, well, where do high potentials fall within the nine box? I don't know how many of you use a nine box. Uh, in some countries, it's much more prevalent than others. Guess what? The people circled down in red are not your high potentials. It's, it's very interesting when we start looking at organizations that religiously use a nine box, how many people that are down in this lagging performance and, lo and low potential we're seen as giving the next chance. Well, they're just not in the right job. Well, I really like them, or their, their, their last three assignments were fantastic. Well, let's face it, there are people that reach the, the top of their ladder. Their ladder may just be shorter than everyone else's in terms of growth in the organization. What we're typically focused on, though, with high potentials are these top four boxes. The top right is a, is a no-brainer, as we say in Tulsa. Uh, those are the individuals that really are the ones that you should grab onto. Don't let them get away. Lock them in a closet because your competitor is trying to hire them. So these are the individuals that you really should be caring about. Those that are in these next three boxes, they've got a lot of potential. But you have to ask yourself, 
Would we see more potential if we had them in the right role? Would we see more potential if we had them under different mentorship or different supervision or leadership? So again, defining your process, defining who's your, potential, your high potentials is very important. Second is, <clears throat> what are you doing in terms of nominating your potentials or identifying these people? What we know is organizations tend to spend a lot of time overestimating the performance of their employees. And so if you just take your performance ratings and try to do a top-down approach, much like what they did at GE, what you may find is some great technical leaders that are never going to go anywhere. Again, 30% of your current high, high performers are actually high potentials. If you believe our data, 90% of those, though, will have trouble at the next level. So what that means is we're talking about a very small group of individuals that are actually high potentials. What we also know is organizations use biased performance measures. And so what you find is the subjectivity, the politically based uh, or biased people meetings. More progressive organizations are inviting OD or HR into the room to have those discussions, to join the discussions with objective data. We do a lot of that with obviously our assessment tools where someone's there talking about strengths and challenges of moving not one level, but maybe two or three levels. And then the other thing that we know is that traditional measures or traditional assessment from a performance standpoint tends to, tends to identify people that at that next level may have counterintuitive or counterproductive behaviors. So if you think about the leadership pipeline model, moving from a level two to say a level four, what do you have to do to become, to come from a, to be a, moving from a supervisory level to a manager of managers? Can you be as obsessed with the details? Can you be as hands-on? Can you be as tactical? No, you can't. You've got to be more strategic. You have to elevate, elevate your thinking, elevate, elevate your game. But yet we're saying because they were really good as a supervisor, they must, that must mean that they're going to be great at supervising supervisors. <coughs> We think you have to use objective measures. I know a few tools that you really ought to use, but we'll save that for Richard's presentation at the end of the day. But I do think you have to take a multi-dimensional approach. And that's what we're seeing again as, as the third best practice in terms of high potential identification and development. And that is an objective, multi-pronged approach that paints a whole picture of the individual. You've got to focus on their work habits. How do they perform? What's their track record? What's their history? You also have to focus on what is their ideal job. We talk a lot about person job fit and also person culture fit. So being able to move to those next levels is ideal if it's the right fit for the individual. So thinking about it almost from a career coaching or a career management perspective. The other thing is looking at purely leadership potential. We know some people have more potential for leadership than others. That's not to say that someone with a very low score on a certain characteristic can't overcome that through a lot of development, through a lot of coaching. But I think every one of us would agree, after you've coached someone for six months, nine months, the outcome is actually really small. Why? Because people are inherently lazy. And so as you change behaviors, it's very easy to revert back to what's natural, especially as we move you into stressful opportunities or stressful situations as you're moving up the talent ladder. And then Adrian identified this morning with some data the probable derailers. Yes, they may help you climb the greasy pole. I would say they're also the characteristics that have you let go of the pole and come crashing down. And so probable derailers are things that really do matter. Sure, <clears throat> some of these characteristics get you noticed and get you promoted. Other characteristics get you passed over or actually get you terminated. Uh, so in terms of who you are really does determine how you lead. The other thing that you have to do in your high potential programs is pay attention to engagement. And engagement's a, another hot topic. It's another, what we would say has become an HR fad. The problem is the engagement is not an HR fad. Engagement's real and engagement has critical, out, it, it creates a critical issue within organizations. Real quickly, what is, what is not engagement? First of all, engagement's not an individual characteristic. Individual's not job satisfaction. Individ engagement's not job involvement. <coughs> And engagement sure is not organizational commitment. What is engagement? Engagement is persisting at a high level in the business regardless of the circumstances. Because you have passion, because you really love the business, you love what you're doing from the standpoint of, I'll keep at it because I've made a commitment. It's positive affect. 
leaders coming back to their team and not saying, well, this is what the people at the top say we have to do, I think it's stupid, but rather truly having positive affect and involvement of saying, we can do things differently, we can be successful. That drives enthusiasm, that drives pride. It also it drives finding the work meaningful. So if you have energized, proud, enthusiastic, positive, positive attitudes towards work as a leader, that filters down to the team. And the team, again, is where the engagement happens. If the team's not engaged, the bottom line suffers. I listed out four characteristics earlier when I was talking about what do we look for in high potentials. They're rewarding to deal with. They actually are competent and pick things up quickly. They're, they're easy to deal with. The integrity, business competency, good judgment, and vision are the other four. And those four things are what, when you ask individuals, and they're in that order for a reason, those are the four things that most employees tell you they're looking for in a good leader or in a future good leader. And those are the four things that we, in essence, put a tick next to every interaction we have with a leader that helps us stay engaged, that drives that level of engagement, which ultimately, as I've said, drives job performance. So if we're using objective assessment data, the fourth thing that we have to do is really use that to drive development. I don't know how many organizations use selection tools, they use different methodologies to identify talent, and then they act as if they don't even have that information available to them anymore. It's what I call the file requirement. We did this, we selected you, now we have to start over and act like we don't know anything about you. Wrong answer. Use the objective assessment data to drive development, to drive personal growth. You do have to identify key strengths for individuals so that they can leverage at that next level. This is not pop psychology. This is not positive psychology. This is helping people understand what are characteristics that they have that they need to start using given that they're now in a different environment. They may be things that they're unaware of. Maybe things they've never had to use in their current employment situation because things are fine. They're just going through the motions. Uh, the team's great. Well, they're going to have characteristics that we need to identify that they should leverage. We definitely have to discuss the derailment characteristics, or what we call the stumbling blocks. You know, without, without focusing on, on the challenges that you're going to have in front of you, it's almost like saying to someone, <clears throat> go run a marathon without any preparation. You know, what, how, how do you expect someone to complete that kind of a task if you're not training? Same thing here. How do you expect someone to avoid derailment when we proactively know they have characteristics that could lead to derailment, when we have the data. So let's focus on coaching and development, not to scare people, but rather to make them aware. Third, we have to help them identify their unconscious biases. From a values and drivers perspective, I have certain values. My interaction with you is driven by those values. And if your values are not like mine, unconsciously, I'm going to think and feel different things or ways about you. I may or may not ever say anything, but it may keep me as an example, as a leader, from giving you an opportunity to work on a STAR project. Why? Because I just don't feel like we fit together. Well, as a leader, one of my key jobs is to grow future talent. So if I'm not aware of these unconscious biases and these values that I have, not only will I not know what kind of culture I'll create, but I also potentially could inhibit someone else's success. All of this leads to focusing on what we call strategic self-awareness. There was a great line, I don't even know who in our organization coined it, it may have been URT, but it's <clears throat> simply, <clears throat> we're the armed merchants uh, in the war for talent, and that is we have assessment data that serves as the arms that help organizations better further their leadership potential and ultimately their overall performance. Best practices. What are the leading companies doing? We have the pleasure of working with different organizations worldwide. Uh, many of our distributors, some of who are with you today in the room, they work with organizations globally as well. And when we look across what are the strategies people are doing to develop their high potentials, what we're seeing is that still we're at the 70-20-10 ratio in terms of development activities, with 70% of it being on the ground, hands-on experiential learning, what you see is only 20 of it comes from coaching and mentoring. And I will say that the latest, uh, the latest survey results say that coaching and mentoring, mentoring is not virtual. Individuals are saying they want face-to-face -face contact. They don't enjoy necessarily the, the uh, uh, phone-based coaching and mentoring, the video phone, the social media. 
what we find is those things coming in dead last in terms of if you ask current high potentials what they want more of, it's face-to-face -face contact. And then finally, only 10% is the classroom, which for many organizations is a sigh of relief. Why? Because that's where they spend all their money. That's also where you, try, you, you tend to find organizations that still believe in classroom learning, try to do a one-size-fits-all. If we know people have different characteristics and need to focus on different development areas, how can we put them in one program that teaches strategic leadership? When the, re the things that I need to develop versus the things that Tomas needs to develop around strategic leadership are completely different. This allows customization, this allows individualization of those development programs. The other thing that we see is development is immediate and actionable. This isn't, a, this isn't come in and let's work on a nine month development plan and at no month number nine we actually assess pro project, pro pro progress, excuse me. Rather we're looking at quick wins, short term durations, short goals, long term effects. Why does that matter? Because it's tied to rewards and performance. So we directly tie their focus of their development, not only to their performance evaluations, but also their opportunities for promotion. Organizations are willing to say, you haven't engaged in development, you haven't taken this process seriously, why don't you go back to your old job? Why don't we find you something else to do? Or perhaps this may not be the right place for you as a, as a potential leader. Not a program, not an event. A lot of organizations talk about this is our 18 month rotation program. What happens after that? How do you continue that energy that's developed and, and really the, the, the individuals inspired by it during the course of that program if it has a start and end date? Treating things as an event from our perspective really diminishes the overall returns. It needs to be an ongoing process. It needs to be an experience that once it starts, there's different ways to continue it throughout the employee life cycle. And then finally, development's got to be key for promotion. Work with a really smart individual that ran all the top leadership programs at Dell for a number of years, the top four programs. And what Brandy would say is every quarter they did a check-in, that is the team that ran the programs. If they didn't see significant participation in the monthly mentoring meetings and the on-the-job performance uh, expectations, the individual was asked to leave the program. They were told you're not going to move from a D2 to a D3 leader unless you're actively engaged. We're not going to grab you by the hand and say, come on, we think you can make it, come on. Sure, they were encouraging, but ultimately, it's the individual's responsibility to act and to, to move on their own development initiatives. So what are, what are five, five strategies in terms of, of doing this? I'm not gonna go into each of these, that's a completely, completely different talk. But most organizations think about, they've got five options when it comes to assessing their bench strength, growing talent from inside, one is more of what we call a touchstone strategy. This is going in and empirically identifying what are the key characteristics we need in people in the future to be successful. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of energy, but what you find is it's very focused on what the organization needs in their industry at that point in time. The drawback of that, there's no focus on the future. So unless you ask the question, what do we need five years from now, then you're already behind the minute that you implement that type of a strategy. Second is more of a traditional leadership forecast, forecast strategy. This is taking a proactive view, five to seven years down the, down the road. What do we need? Let's talk about human capital in a supply chain fashion. Where do we have people strategically positioned? What are we doing to coach and develop them? Who have we identified as that high potential that we can move into those next levels, but we know it's a way out. One of our clients talks about the percolation factor. We put people out there in these different assignments and let them gain experience. We can then evaluate them in real time and think, they think of it as a test drive. We put someone in a lower risk environment, we see how they do, we put them under stress and pressure, and we evaluate what happens when they move back into a senior corporate role. You can go out and buy it, that's the talent acquisition strategy. Let's go back to my second slide, 66% from the outside fail. Uh, it's an expensive strategy and the success rate is actually quite low. Or you can also take a talent management strategy. This is more of grow them internally. It's great, it works, it's better than bringing them in from the outside if you pay attention to who you're identifying and who you're growing. Again, 44% of those promoted from the inside. 
struggle or fail as well within the first 18 months. And you can take more of an accountability strategy. This is something we're hearing more and more in terms of the leadership competency. And that is that leaders are being held to, the, to a competency. It's labeled a lot of different ways. The most common way that we've seen it is a talent grower or a talent manager or uh, anything that has to do with asking your line leaders to identify themselves and take it upon themselves to grow and develop their future successors. We think a combination of all five is probably the best strategy. Uh, and again, it's all focused though on using objective data to correctly identify individuals to move into these types of programs. <coughs> a few final thoughts. First, we know leadership's key. Leadership's not key because the leader's doing the right things, it's the leader's driving engagement. And if you have engaged, uh, an engaged workforce, they will drive your business. They will drive your customer satisfaction, that will drive your return, your business return, uh, and your profitability. Second, you've got to use objective measures if you actually want to have a fighting chance. Uh, the whole issue of halo effects, of greater errors, of personal opinions, time and time again, it just clouds the people process. It clouds the high potential process. Third, whatever you do, you've got to have accountability. If you're going to have programs, if you're going to identify talent, you as HR, OD professionals, as consultants, you have to build in accountability processes to where people don't just say, oh, it's just another program, it's just another event. Rather, this is something I want to be a part of, I want to belong in, because it drives my future and it drives the potential of the organization. And then finally, you drive strategic self-awareness. It's all about empowering people to understand their strengths, their challenges, how they fit and what they value, and how that all drives their leadership style. Once you do that, though, you've got to monitor engagement. You've got to monitor how those characteristics at any level of the organization are driving engagement within your business. And that is it.